And now with our lesson, Eric Brandt. Good morning. Good morning. There's a wonderful passage in the New Testament, in the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, which is worth memory, meditation, and application. And that is known as the armor of God. It's one of my favorite passages, and I would like for us to turn our attention to the armor of God. The Apostle Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me that I may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I make it that I may make it known fearlessly as I should. After the Apostle Paul has written everything he has written up to this point to the Ephesians, he has reminded the Ephesians of the glorious grace of God, as he expressed it in Jesus, as he's taught them how to apply this grace, how to apply the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that has saved us, not by works of righteousness of our own, but by faith in Christ and in his righteousness. After he is shared the gospel and told them how they are to live in light of that gospel, he then says, finally, finally, the final word is, be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. His wish for the Christians at Ephesus is that they would be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And he tells them how to stand strong. He says, Stand firm. Stand firm. So the final message is stand strong, stand firm in the mighty power of God. And then he reminds them how they are to do this. They are to stand strong. And then he talks about the various elements of equipment that the Lord has given us 
to equip us for the battle that we are to face. Now we will look at the first three of those pieces of equipment in today's lesson. And we will continue next week with, well, actually two weeks from now, with some more equipment that the Lord has given us so that we can stand strong, stand firm in the strength of the Lord. The first thing he says, stand firm, stand strong, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. A Roman soldier didn't have the same kind of battle dress uniforms that are issued today by the military. No, they had a tunic. They had a tunic, a large square piece of material. It had holes for the head. It had holes for the arms. Now, as you might imagine, if you had a big, large, square piece of material with a hole in the head and a hole in the arms, it might get a bit unwieldy. And if you were going into battle with a big, flowy robe, it might hinder you somehow. Well, thankfully, they had a piece of equipment that would prevent that from happening. They had a belt. They had a belt that would wrap that tunic. They could tuck it in so that they would be fit for battle. When the time came for a battle or a long march, they would gird themselves up by gathering up all the loose tunic and tuck it in so that they could go and make a march. It would be very foolish to go into battle without that belt because he could easily trip and fall. Or for that matter, imagine how the enemy could just grab him and boom, toss him down. So you have to watch out for being too loose. And so they were girded up with the belt. And so in the same way, we are to gird ourselves with the belt of truth. The belt of truth. We've learned that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We are not fighting a battle with tanks, with rocket-propelled grenades, with M16s. Our enemy is not coming against us with physical bullets. But we have a spiritual force of evil that is scheming, that is plotting our downfall. And our enemy has been described as a father of lies. And his strategy, one of his strategies, is to distort the truth. And so a principal weapon against these spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms is the truth. And so as we go into the battle that we face, we are to be girded with the belt of truth around our waist. We are grateful that as we come together week after week, we get to hear the truth as it is sung in our hymns, as it is proclaimed to us at the Lord's table, as we read and hear the word of the scriptures, the Lord has given us truth, has given us the story of how he has created us all the way from the beginning in Genesis, all the way to the end. We know how the story ends in Revelation. We have hope and we have been given the truth of the scriptures 
as our guide, as a lamp to our feet, a light for our path. And it helps us to stand firm. It helps us to be centered. It helps us to know who we are, to know who God is, to know what Jesus has done for us. And therefore, we are able to stand strong against the deceiving things that the evil one would want to plant in our minds. I've been reading through Genesis this week, among other of my readings. Um, as I become more and more convinced that a knowledge of the scriptures, an engagement of the scriptures is essential for all of our spiritual health, where those who have studied it on a large scale have discovered that Christians who engage in scripture at least four times a week are far more likely to be spiritually healthy and to be spiritually strong. I said, okay, as a preacher, I need to model that. If I'm not reading scripture on a daily basis, if I am not girding my mind with scripture, how can I expect other people to do that? And so I've had the privilege of immersing myself, and I'm starting with Genesis. And as I've been reading through Genesis, I, I've noticed something. That the people that we look to as heroes, like Jacob and Abraham and Isaac, the, the, the sons of Jacob, these were all human beings, and they were not perfect. They were not perfect. Yes, they exhibited faith in God, but they were not perfect. In fact, with Jacob, it's perhaps more obvious than others. He was quite a deceiver. His nickname was Heel Grabber, the one who grabs the heels. He was a deceiver. He was a trickster. And the Lord had to work him over to the point where he had to make him walk with a limp. But finally, Jacob got the message, and it was a, a rough road for Jacob because the Lord had to work him over. In fact, he thought he had lost his son, Joseph. And he thought his head was going to go down into the grave in sorrow. But the Lord had a plan throughout all of this difficulty. The Lord had a plan to take this Joseph and... Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. He was betrayed by Potiphar's wife. He was betrayed by one of Pharaoh's servants who, who forgot him, for whom he had interpreted a dream, and he forgot him in prison, let him continue to rot in prison. And finally, he remembered when Pharaoh had a dream to, oh, my heart is pricking me because there was a man who had this gift of interpreting dreams, and he is in prison, and so Pharaoh called him, and after he had shaven and washed his face, Pharaoh asked him to interpret the dream. And sure enough, he said that days of famine are going to come. And the Lord sent me to make sure that you store up grain for this famine which is about ready to come. And, and at the end of it all, after all of the suffering that Joseph went through, his brothers came to him, and after Jacob had died, his brothers came to him and said, please forgive us, because they knew that they had done terrible things to Joseph. But Joseph said, you meant what you did for me for evil, but God meant it for good, that we could save a generation of nations. Now, as, as I was reading Genesis, now that's just the first book of the Bible. It tells us where we come from. It tells us who we are. It tells us that God has a plan. It tells us that things happen in this earth which often don't make sense. In Genesis, usually it is the older serving the younger, whereas in this world it's usually the younger serving the older. 
that God has a plan for our lives and that he is at work even when it seems like things have fallen apart. And that's just Genesis. Then you go through the other books of Scripture, Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, Deuteronomy, and you see all the way from Genesis to Revelation how it all fits in an unfolding story. And then we learn the truth about ourselves. We realize that, yes, we have struggles in this life, but there is hope. And it all comes to a crescendo with Jesus. Jesus, who dies for us and resurrects again, is our hope, is our righteousness. It makes us strong. It makes us able to stand firm, not in our own strength, but in the strength of his might. So as we go into battle, we need to make sure that we are girded up with the truth, because as we are girded up with truth, not in our own strength, not in our own wisdom, but with the belt of truth of the word of God, of the scriptures, we will be able to be strong in battle. We will be able to stand firm against the devil's schemes. So there's the belt of truth. The belt of truth buckled around your waist. The second piece of equipment, the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness in place. For the Roman soldier, the breastplate was a piece of equipment that was a tough, sleeveless piece of armor which covered the soldier's torso. It may have been made of leather. It may have been made of heavy linen. To this heavy linen may be sewed overlapping slices, now get this, of animal hooves, or maybe pieces of metal things that could be woven and overlapped so that uh, a spear would not penetrate it. Maybe some of them were large pieces of metal that were molded or hammered to conform to the body. The purpose of this was obvious. It was to protect, to protect the heart, the lungs, the intestines, the other vital organs. Yes, battle is bloody. Battle is mean. So the breastplate was to prevent that from happening. Our enemy is out there seeking to ensnare us, to condemn us, to kill and destroy. We are to stand firm with the belt or with the breastplate of righteousness in place. There's some interesting passages, passages of scripture in the Old Testament that talk about God putting on righteousness. And just from the book of Isaiah, there, there are several passages which use this imagery. For example, you don't have to turn there, but if you wish to, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 5. It talks about God, and it, it, it says, The Lord will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. He says, Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. In Isaiah chapter 59, starting with verse 15. In fact, let's start with verse 14. It says, So justice is driven back, and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found in Whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So he worked, his own arm worked salvation for him. 
and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as, a, as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. And so in a, in a land where there was no justice, where there was no righteousness, where there was nothing but rebellion and treachery, where there was oppression and revolt, where there were lies, the Lord comes into this and he brings justice. He brings righteousness. He brings honesty. He shuns evil. He looked around to see if there was anyone else who was clothing himself with justice. He was looking to see if there were any that were righteous. Finding none, he girded himself. He put on righteousness as his breastplate, the helmet of salvation on his head, the garments of vengeance, the cloak of zeal on himself. And he stood strong and firm. And he brought justice. He repaid his enemies according to their works. The imagery is similar. There's even another passage in Isaiah chapter 52, the first couple of verses. It says, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong passage. Isaiah 52, verses 1 to 2. Awake, awake, O Zion, clothe yourself with strength. Put on your garments of splendor, O Jerusalem, the holy city. The uncircumcised and defiled will not enter you again. Shake off your dust, rise up, sit enthroned, O Jerusalem. Free yourself from the chains on your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. So the Lord is telling Jerusalem to stand, clothe themselves with, with strength, with splendor, to shake off the oppression that had characterized them, to be strong and clothed with strength and righteousness as the Lord had clothed himself with strength and righteousness. As we become Christians, we hear the truth of the gospel. We realize that we need to be baptized into Christ, and we make that decision to be buried with Christ in baptism and to rise and walk in newness of life. Now, is that the end of our Christian walk? Do we just stop there? Do we just wait until we die so we can go to heaven and be with the Lord? No. We have to grow. We have to grow in Christ-like character. We, the work just starts. Now, we do good works not, not to earn our salvation, not to, not to do something to be good in God's, God's eyes. No. It is to be conformed to the character of Jesus, to become more like Christ, to put off unrighteousness and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are clothed with Jesus. We are baptized into Christ, but we are to continually put on the character of Christ, that we are to grow in the fruits of the Spirit, that we are to grow in love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We are to become more like Jesus the breastplate of righteousness in place. The more we are conformed to the character of Christ, the more equipped we will be to stand strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The time to be prepared for the battle is now. We can't wait. We don't know when the day of evil will come. The stronger we are, the less we are likely to fall into the snares of the evil one. So Paul encourages us to stand firm, with the belt of truth buckled around our waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. And then finally, for today, with our feet...
fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. With our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So there's this imagery of, uh, of shoes, boots, a soldier's boot. In Roman times, this boot was a half boot. And a, a Roman legionnaire would wear this while he was on duty. And now, I, I, I don't understand this, uh, our military folks, but the, the, the Roman boot was an open boot. Would you want to wear an open-toed shoe into battle? I wouldn't. But I guess they felt confident enough to go into battle with open-toed boots to each his own. It was an open-toed leather boot with a heavily <coughs> nail-studded sole, which was tied to the ankles and shins with straps. And this piece of equipment was obviously very important because it gave the soldier a firm footing so that they wouldn't slip. And so our feet are to be fitted with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So we are to be ready. We are to be on our A game. But think about this, the gospel of peace. Our enemy wants to alienate. Our enemy wants to create discord. Our enemy wants to tear apart. Our enemy wants to bring people away from each other. The armor of the Christian is peace. Peace with God. Peace with one another. God has given us, even as he has reconciled us to himself, he has given each of us the ministry of reconciliation. That we are to be, what? Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. So we are to be peacemakers. Our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Our gospel is a gospel of peace. It is one. Look at all of these weapons that we have, okay? Truth. Righteousness. Peace. The good news of peace. Faith. Salvation. The Word of God. Prayer. The Holy Spirit. Our weapons put people back together again. Our weapons are not offensive weapons. Our, our weapons are healing weapons. <clears throat> Sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Kill them with kindness. <laughs> our war, our battle, is to bring peace. Our battle is to bring healing. Our battle is to bring people together. Our battle is to bind up wounds. Our battle is to feed the hungry. Our battle is to visit the lonely. Our battle is to heal the sick. Our battle is to use whatever talents God has given us to serve others in good works. And our battle is to become more like Jesus wherever we go. And we are to be ready with the good news of Jesus, that we are to be ready at all times so that we will not slip. Our focus is on the Lord. Our focus is on honoring and serving others. And this is very different from the tactics of the evil one. And so, the, so Paul is encouraging the Ephesians, and he's speaking to us. He is telling us with our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. As we close this point and soon come to the sermon, I just realized I didn't appoint anybody with 
cards red or green, yellow, red, and so my apologies. Uh, but um, there's a song in our songbook. In fact, if you wish to turn to it, it's number four. Oh, wait, actually, you know what? I took this out of, out of a different songbook. Um, peace, perfect peace. I'll tell you what number it is. It is number 479, 479. And look at what we have in peace. Peace, perfect peace, in this dark world of sin. The blood of Jesus whispers peace within. Peace, perfect peace, in thronging duties pressed to do the will of Jesus. This is rest. Peace, perfect peace, with sorrows surging round. On Jesus' bosom, naught but calm is found. It is enough. Earth's struggle soon shall cease, and Jesus call us to heaven's perfect peace. So our Lord came on a peace mission, and he calls us to be ready with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So, stand firm, stand strong, with the belt of truth, buckled around your waist, be girded, don't let your enemy bring you down, don't trip over yourself, but be ready with the truth, know who you are, know who God is, be strong, look good, be strong in the Lord with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, knowing that as the evil one would throw his barbs at you, that you are protected by the righteousness of God that is in Christ. It is not our own righteousness, but we are called to be conformed increasingly to the character of Jesus, being empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Every one of you are being commissioned. All of you. I'm looking at all of you. You are now commissioned on a peace-making mission. Where there is war, where there is discord, where there is strife. You are called to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. You are to bring peace where there is discord. And that you are ready with the gospel of peace. As you take these active steps to not just being a passive observer, but an active peacemaker, you're not only going to stand strong, but you are going to shine. You're going to be bright in a dark world. And people are going to wonder, what is it about you? And then you can say, well, let me tell you what it is about me. Let me tell you something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. That, that's going back a little while. Um, then we can tell people about Jesus, the perfect peacemaker who calls us to be reconciled to him. He always keeps the invitation open. Say, come unto me, all you who are weary and are heavy, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You will find peace. You will find hope. You will find the love of God that gives meaning for all things. If there are any prayers... If there's a desire for anyone to become a Christian, the invitation is open. Whatever your need may be, please make it known as we stand and sing.